I have no expectation that they'll have great success, but I want to see what we can do. My background is I have a degree in horticulture, so and I work with a landscape company. So I have a lot of knowledge in how to recuperate the land. I know that there's been a lot of damage. Uh, forest fires in general, uh, they can wreak havoc on soils. Uh, when it's just a, some forest fires actually can be good. If it burns quickly and burns through and burns the undergrowth and doesn't kill trees and doesn't stay for a long period of time and doesn't burn super hot, forest fires can actually be really good for an ecosystem. Just down the, just down the driveway here, our neighbors, uh, they didn't have dense forest. They had a lot of meadowland and it burnt through really quick and burnt all the meadows and came through. And within three weeks, those meadows were greening up. The fires were still raging in once it passed here, but that meadow was already turning green. That's actually very healthy for environment. But when it burns hot, when it burns long, um, it can essentially cook out all the nutrients that are in the soil. Uh, so people look at all the ashes and say, hey, that's great nutrients. Long term that might be true, but short term it's not. Uh, the ash makes the soil very alkaline. Uh, and in Colorado, we already have a, a, a neutral to alkaline soil. So making it even more alkaline makes it difficult for a lot of plants to survive. Uh, and ash in general is also alkaline. So you get all that ash and charcoal falling down, it's not great for the soil in the short term. Now, you may have heard a little bit about biochar. And really all biochar is, is a really fine charcoal um, that people put to add nutrients to the soil. So we figure, well, why isn't that helping? Well, biochar isn't just charcoal. What's important about biochar are the microorganisms that live in it. So it's the nematodes and mycorrhizae that love that, that, that charcoal, that fine charcoal that live in there very well. That's what you're really wanting from biochar. Uh, and while we may have had quite a bit of mycorrhizae and other microorganisms in our soils, when the fires came through, killed all those organisms. So now it's a rebuild stage. So yes, our soils are prepped to have good structure for these microorganisms and even uh, these micronutrients that we are going to need. Uh, but we got to start that. Um, so as this goes along, you'll see me bring in compost material. I may even put biochar and other mycorrhizae into the soil just as a starter because they will spread not nearly as fast as they need to to cover 10 acres, but at least where I'm planting new plants, I will definitely be amending the soils um, so that it gives them kind of this jump start uh, while we're rebuilding the soils in this area. You may see in the future, the plants I bring in aren't necessarily all native. I will be doing some native, but uh, we're at about 8,500 to 8,900 feet on our property. We're in that range and it is a pretty tall range. But at that elevation, there's only a set, uh, there's only a set amount of trees that are native to this area. So we got the Engelman spruce, we got the pines, both ponderosa and uh, a few other scotch and uh, mostly ponderosa and, and scotch are what I've seen in this area. I've definitely seen some white fir. Um, we have the aspen. Uh, but there, there really isn't any hardwood at all. There's some scrub stuff, like uh, definitely have some Rocky Mountain maple that we've seen on the property, but really small, more shrub than any sort of tree. Uh, and when I replant, I'll definitely be experimenting. Um, having spent a little bit of my life out east when I was younger, I really do like hardwoods. I like the oaks. I like the maples. Um, we used to live in Illinois where we harvested maple syrup from, from maple trees on our property. Uh, so yeah, there's some different trees that I'd like to try. I have no expectation that they'll have great success, 
but I want to see what we can do. Um, they're likely to not have great success because it isn't the prime condition. The soils are too alkaline. The elevation's too high. Uh, the weather actually isn't too bad. Uh, from a temperature standpoint, it's very similar to some of the areas that they grow in naturally. But we'll, we'll have some fun and I'll, I'll let you know a little more once I get both seeds and saplings that I'm ordering for the spring. When you plant seed, you have to know that there's only a certain germination rate. Um, of all the seeds you plant, you may only get 40% of them to even sprout. And then you may only get 20% of those to make it through the first year. So you have to be able to accept that there's gonna be a lot of loss. Um, when you buy saplings, they have a much better survivability because they've already gotten through that 40% that don't even, even, don't even sprout and they've already made it through their first year. So now you have a little bit more established plant. If you have a dry summer or even a dry winter, they could not make it. Plus, you've just invited all of the uh, animals that are looking for forage into your property. So you're gonna lose some to, to those animals as well. Um, but that's okay, I, I understand that. Uh, the challenge for us is gonna be, how do we keep it watered? Well, I, I still have a spring on my property and I'll show you a picture of what we had developed. I spent some time developing the spring and I created a masonry bulkhead and I piped the water down the hill closer to our camp where I put it into a 275 gallon tote. Unfortunately, when the fires came through, it destroyed everything that we had. The masonry bulkhead is still in place. The spring is still functioning, but it's all got to be rebuilt. And that spring produces about 55 gallons of water a day. So I've kind of worked it out. I think I got to figure it out so that I can uh, uh, set up a drip system off of that spring where I have the spring fill a tote and I can run a battery operated uh, timer uh, from the, the tote to then water all the trees um, through a drip system. So that's my intent and I will definitely do some experimenting. I'm sure I will not water every tree. I want to see how someone do without intervention from that water because the idea is they need to be able to get the established so I don't have to water them all the time. Uh, with 55 gallons a day, I'm topping out at just over 380 trees that I can plant at a time and be able to water them. Uh, after you've got them established, after a year or two in the ground, I'm going to err on a year for most of them. Some of the ones that aren't as drought resistant, I may err on two. Uh, I'll switch over, so I'll start watering the next new plants. But I do have a limitation on how many plants I can plant per year if I want to water them as well. Yes, I will and am going to uh, uh, purposely plant a lot of these trees without irrigation. And I will try everything from in some of the rocky conditions to where it appears that there might be more water and more drainages. Uh, just to see what takes where and really see how I should be developing the property. Thank you for watching and join us this coming spring on our next chapter of this journey as I purchase and plant the seeds and saplings. Please feel free to leave a comment and please like and subscribe.